Hello and welcome to the Weekly Skeptic, episode 80. I'm Nick Dixon here with token liberal Toby Young. And coming up on the show today, can Missy cling on, Wales gets a new first minister, and Scotland's dystopian new hate crime law. Plus, of course, peak woke and extra content for all our subscribers on basedmedia.org. But Toby, first we've got to address the elephant in the room. We're in a studio. It's the Westminster Podcast Studio. Very exciting. We're normally just on a sort of Zoom yeah. call. Now we're actually in person. I can almost touch it. I, I won't. But I could. <laughs> and it's, I think this is going to be a permanent change. From now on, we are going to do the podcast from a studio in person. So hopefully it should be better. Yes. Unless it goes really badly, then we might retreat. <laughs> but it should be better in theory. Hopefully fewer 10-minute monologues from you. Probably more me. More me <laughs> chipping in with banter. <laughs> we don't have a live audience, though, so I won't, I won't be able to show off as much. Yeah, but I think, I think kind of the fact that you're doing it in front of me and um, Alex, who's yes. recording this and producing it, um, I think you will probably you will probably raise your game. You just can't help but perform, and this will Show bring on. out the performer. Really. Yeah, for one one disinterested <laughs> viewer. Um, all right. Well, hopefully people like our new setup. And um, the other quick thing to mention is Weekly Skeptic Live, April eighth. Tickets are selling pretty well, actually. They are. We've sold about twenty five percent of the tickets so far. They've been on sale for less than a week. And um, anyone interested in buying a ticket, go to the um, uh, based media.org website click on events and uh, you can link to the ticket sales site on eventbrite right there it's 25 pounds for a ticket april 8th monday at lola's downstairs at the hippodrome that's in london we got criticized before for not saying not making it clear <laughs> that the hippodrome yeah. is in london it is in london it's just off it's practically on leicester square lola's is in the basement the gubbins downstairs in the depths of the Hippodrome, and I think we open the door at about 6.30 and curtain up, as we say in the theatrical world, curtain up at 7, curtain down at 9. And if people want to have a drink with us afterwards, they can do that for £75 and the first drink is free. So, yeah, if you want to come, go to basemedia.org, click on events, and you can purchase tickets there. All right, good. We got the plugs in early. Should we move on to do some of the actual content then? Well, hang on. We should oh. also say that um, if people want to see the premium content um, in the Weekly Skeptic, they need to become a premium subscriber if they haven't already. Um, and they can do that by going to basemedia.org. And um, for as little as £5 a month, they can become a premium subscriber. And then they can see the extended, uncensored version of this show. Um, and the free part would be about an hour, uh, maybe a bit longer, but then there's another 20, 30 minutes of um, uh, premium content, which you can only see if you're a premium subscriber. If you become a £10 premium subscriber, then you can see, you can participate in our monthly Zoom calls. Yes. Um, and if you want to look, look, see what that looks like, uh, just become a £5 premium subscriber, go to the premium section on basemedia.org, and you can look at our last uh, Zoom call conversation. People ask us questions you can ask us anything mm -hmm. that went on for about an hour a bit longer that was a lot of fun yeah and you get toby's real opinions not what he says on the show and uh, the show is now about 50 minutes of adverts by the way 10 minutes of content back at the end <laughs> we just do ads and at the end we say and rishi sucks goodbye um <laughs> all right well let's start on rishi then i mean as we record we don't actually have wi-fi in here yet so he might be like gone and we're just in this little box and we don't know but last time i checked there were four, there was a rumor from christopher hope uh, now at GB News, of course, formerly of the Telegraph, that there was 40 letters in he had been told by uh, someone, uh, you know, a source. And that, of course, they need 53 for the confidence vote to go ahead. And a, a senior Tory MP told Christopher Hope they will move against him this week. So it's all getting very, like, night of the long knives. And, um, and Margaret's back to issue, of course, didn't in the past, but he's done his conservative loyalist thing, said, I think now is the time to be loyal to the Conservative Party. And Kemi has dismissed it all, saying, I'll oh, grow up, all her thing. But Penny is on manoeuvres. But there's a little bit of a confusion there, because, or a complication, because she could actually lose her seat. She had a majority last time of something like 15,000 and something. But actually, that's not necessarily safe anymore. Mm. Nothing's safe anymore yes. with the Tories. So if she could do a Joe Swinson. Yes, but I'm not sure I, I've understood that argument, if that is indeed an argument being made from by Rishi loyalists. Don't back Penny as a rival to Rishi because she could lose her seat. That's effectively saying we're doing so badly under Rishi that even an MP with a majority over 16,000 could lose. So don't choose anyone other than Rishi. That would be too dangerous. It's like that's a poor argument for Rishi. Yeah, yeah, good point. I mean, but they're both bad, aren't they? P Penny would be an absolute disaster. And I, I was looking at this as well. One cabinet minister um, told the Times, I, 
I just think where where we were in 1997, the country has decided it's time for a change. They've tried a few things and nothing has worked. We're like a rabbit in headlights. It just isn't working. But think about 97. We, that was obviously we didn't have Blairism yet because he hadn't come in. But we went from sort of non-Blair to like Blair. Imagine, but we're already trapped in the Blairite paradigm now, as Carl likes to say. Imagine going from Blair to whatever's even worse than Blair, like the Starmer. I mean, how bad is that going to be? Well, interestingly, that 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 felt. So um, even though he did reference the 1997 um, Labour majority, um, that point uh, that there are kind of um, seasons in politics, um, uh, and um, it was originally made by Jim Callaghan. Uh, on the eve of the 1979 general election, which he said, you know, there are affairs in the tides of men, quoting Julius Caesar. And, you know, if if if, if the tide changes, it doesn't matter how fleet footed, how politically astute you are. The tide is against you and there's really nothing you can do to survive in those circumstances. And the point George Osborne was making is that it feels like the tide has changed. So even if the conservatives, you know, move the deck chairs around on the Titanic, it ain't going to make much difference at this stage. Mixed yeah. metaphor there. Anyway. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We're mixing <laughs> metaphors. We're, we're, when you're in the studio, when we've been here a while, we'll get our metaphors absolutely nailed down. I mean, we should talk about what went wrong for Rishi last week, which has prompted this kind of feverish leadership speculation. I mean, you and I have been talking on this show about the possibility that Rishi may go before the next general election and the Tories might be led by someone else into that contest mm-hmm. uh, for some time. But it's only really started to be talked about within the mainstream media. It's only really begun to dominate the headlines in the past few days. And that's partly because Rishi had a really bad week, probably his worst week in Downing Street last week. I thought you were going to say it's partly because of our podcast. Oh, they, <laughs> we, we started to influence the proceedings. Oh, go on. So you had a bad week. You mean Lee Anderson, presumably? Well, it was Lee Anderson. And yeah. it, it wasn't just that he was blamed for the fact that Lee Anderson joined reform and is now using his kind of soapbox in order to campaign against the Conservatives. And they're obviously terrified that reform are going to take votes away from them, particularly in red wall seats like uh, Lee Anderson's seat. Uh, it was also that, well, why, Rishi, did you give Lee Anderson a platform in the first place? Why did you create this monster who is now turned against us by making him deputy chairman of the Conservative body? So it, it, that's, that, that went to his judgment. And then there was this other issue. I mean, that was bad enough. It kind of, you know, it, it brought that whole festering boil to you know it, 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 it that was bad but the, the boil burst um but um uh, just go with that in future don't bother with metaphors that was bad lee anderson so that was bad. bad um uh, but but in addition there was the frank hester yeah. scandal um so this conservative donor largest single conservative donor in the past year given 10 million to the party great guy um so, <laughs> Said said something about um, Diane Abbott. He said that uh, what did he say? He said that she should be shot. He said he said um, was was part of it. He makes a, he makes it make he makes her want to hate all black women. Yeah, he said she should be shot. He he said seeing seeing um, Diane Abbott speak made him hate all black women. Mm. Um, and well, you uh, should just hate Diane Abbott for the content of her character. This has always been and, my point. And um, uh, the the um, the initial Tory defence of this by I think it was uh, Mel Stride, the Work and Pension Secretary. Uh, the initial reaction, and he'd obviously been kind of tasked to say this by kind of Downing Street. He said that um, while Hester's comments were inappropriate, they weren't gender based or race based. He's apologised, and I think we need to move on from that. That's the kind of loyalty that £10 million will buy you in mm. the Tory high command. Uh, then Kemi upset the apple cart. That, that, that line didn't hold for very long because Kemi then came out and presumably, you know, without Downing Street's approval, um, said that actually his comments were racist. She said the idea of linking criticism of her, Diane Abbott, to being a black woman is racist. And then Downing Street had to change their line and then Rishi Sunak came out and he agreed with Kemi. Yes, in fact, these comments were unacceptably racist. Um, and that made him look kind of, you know, hopeless, you know, politically kind of tone deaf, hadn't condemned the comments for being racist in the first place, had initially tried to produce this kind of half-hearted defence of this guy, had to be kind of pointed in the right direction by one of his cabinet ministers. Um, it made him look completely hopeless. So that the combination of those two events following hot on the heels of each other uh, had created a kind of sense of crisis and uh, doom uh, within the parliamentary conservative body thinking what one particular minister said um was it a minister 
Yeah, I think it was. Um, do, 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 do. He never misses an opportunity to miss an opportunity. Um, uh, it was an absolutely slam dunk case of racism, a very easy thing to call out, but he didn't do it. He is constantly triaging. It's constant crisis management. The budget hasn't made the blindest bit of difference. And this guy went on to say, and this I think was significant, for the first time, I'm not convinced. I used to think that the cost of moving to a new leader was greater than the cost of maintaining the status quo. I'm not sure I'm right anymore. So that, that's the critical kind of calculation that's changed. Until now, I think the prevailing consensus in the Parliamentary Conservative Party was that the cost to the Tories of having yet another leadership election before the general uh, would be much higher than the cost of keeping Rishi in situ. But now they think he's so bad. He's so politically stupid. He's so talentless as a politician. Uh, he's going to make so many more mistakes like the two he's just made last week that actually the cost of keeping him may be we've now decided greater than the cost of getting rid of him. We might as well roll the dice because, you know, we're marching to certain doom with this halfwit. It's a pity that it's a race scandal that's done that. I mean, you know, so trivial in, in, in a way. It's like uh, the Chris Pincher thing causing so many problems for Boris or even the cake thing. It's kind of nonsense. I mean, I, I think that I, I think Kemi's throwing him under the bus there. I mean, I know you love Kemi and probably Kemi's people listen to this podcast. So we're not dissing Kemi, but it's a bit lame to be like, oh, it was. I mean, I suppose it's hard to say it wasn't racist, but it's I, I feel like he's been thrown under the bus and it's kind of silly that the Tories get so embroiled in the in these uh, sort of endless. Is it racist? You know, this is all our politics is now. It's just two people shouting at each other across Parliament going, you were racist. No, you're more racist. That's all we have now. I call it a grievance management society. This is always, We don't even have liberalism. You're just managing different grievances from different minority groups calling each other racist. Meanwhile, they all hate the majority group and that's just kind of normalised. But the thing about Diane Abbott, she's, she's just absolutely milking this. She did an interview where she said, oh, you know, this is, I think, you know, obviously Starmer should give back the whip, blah, blah. She's trying to get back the whip. But there's no logical reason why you should get the whip back just because someone's been rude to you, even if they've been horrible a few years ago in a private meeting. But this is how it works with identity politics. It's like, oh, I, I have some victim points now and I can just spend them and cash them in wherever I want. So I get to, oh, I've been wrong. That's 10 victim points. I can spend that on getting the whip back. But it doesn't make any sense. Well, I guess to Starmer's credit, he hasn't actually he hasn't. given her the whip back. And Starmer is showing he's a bit of a tough, ruthless Blair character in a way, isn't he? He's, he's getting rid of all the dodgy people from his party. Yeah, I heard that he said to her, you know, is there anything I can do for you? He's like, yeah, give me the whip back. He's like, anything I can do at all. <laughs> just, just like with the whip. And he's like, I'm here for you. Just, you know, didn't want to do that one thing she wanted. And she wasn't allowed to talk in the House of Commons. She stood up about 40 times. The other thing she said, which I didn't agree with, okay, we could, maybe it's racist, but she said it was incitement to violence. The phrase should be shot in a private meeting. It was obvious banter. You know, my granddad always used to say to me, he wants shooting. He probably wasn't actually going to go and kill anyone. No. Do you know what I mean? The, the idea that's incitement to violence is so absurd. Also, it's not quite clear. Let's suppose you accepted that that statement was an incitement to violence. Well, it's not completely clear who should get the blame. The person who made it and what he believed to be a private meeting where it wouldn't be repeated outside the room or the snake in the room <laughs> that publicises it yeah. afterwards. Um, it's like, it's like the, this comes up at the Free Speech Union a lot. You know, people get put through a disciplinary procedure at work because they've said something on social media that has supposedly brought the firm or, or, or the whatever it is, into disrepute. Um, and, um, well, what often they've said these things um, uh, in a purely private capacity, and there's nothing to link them to the firm in question until, you know, um, a, 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 a disgruntled colleague who maybe was overlooked for a promotion, which they got, um, links their social media account to the firm. And it's that, surely, which brings the firm into disrepute, if the statement does indeed yeah. do that, not the original comment, which, you know, the guy made making no connection between him and the firm. That's far too subtle, though, isn't it, Toby? I know in Toby's rational subtle. world, that would mean something, but <laughs> that means nothing in politics, does it? But we we'll should probably move on to this soon. But what about quickly, Penny? Is she the answer or who is who is going to yeah. come in? Well, interestingly, obviously, um, Penny's not the answer, by the way. Before everyone shouts me, obviously, she's not. I'm just being a host. Yeah, no, she's well, not the answer to anything. Unless the question is, who's the most woke Tory, then put the answer's Penny. But it's not even clear that could be Alicia Cohn's, but it, it's not even clear that. Um, Penny is being put up as the answer. So there was this initial flurry of rumours last week that Penny was the candidate um, the right of the party had decided to kind of coalesce around. Um, uh, and and that, you know, that raised a few eyebrows, you know, because she's, she's, she's not a right wing 
Tory. She hasn't hitherto been associated with the right of the party. Why are these right wing groups uh, falling in behind Penny? And then there was this kind of another flurry of rumours, quick on the heels of the previous flurry, to the effect that actually she was just a stalking horse. So this was um, uh, in in the, 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 when 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 Thatcher was deposed, um, when the first um, challenge was made against Margaret Thatcher. I think it was Sir Anthony Lewis was the stalking horse. He was a kind of backbench Tory MP, and he 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 challenged Margaret Thatcher. Now you can't do that these days; the rules have changed. But I think what 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 what's meant by the idea of Penny being a stalking horse is that if the right pretend they're willing to get behind her and she has a real chance, then they hope that supporters of Penny will put in letters to the 1922 committee, and once it reaches, I think, the 53 54 threshold. Uh, that triggers a vote of no confidence in Rishi Sunak within the parliamentary party. And if he then loses that vote of no confidence, then that triggers a leadership election, at which point the kind of subsequent set of rumours had it, um, the Tories would immediately ditch Penny and row in behind their actual candidate, who we still don't know who that is. Could be Pretty Patel, could be Kemi, could be Suella Braverman. Yeah, would Pretty Patel want to be associated with the kind of one nation loser side of the Tories, you know, I see her as being part of the new Farage breakaway. And there was a rumour Farage had well, no, that's decided... That's the idea. The, oh, sorry. The right, oh, sorry. the real candidate. They're, oh, yeah. They're not really coalescing behind Penny. Yeah, but... They're just pretending to. So Kemi's sent oh, yeah, yeah. support. Oh, yeah, but I'm wondering... letters if... to trigger the election if they think, well, it's a dead cert for Penny. I mean, part of the, one of the reasons... Yeah, but I was wondering if Peter Patel would, would even want it before the election, if she would hang around for the new sort of Farage post-election thing that I'm saying is going to happen. But he might stay in reform. Anyway, there's rumours that Farage is going back to reform. Did you hear that as well? I, I'm, I, I, I mean, I don't, I don't trust anything, any rumours about okay. Farage. I think we just have to wait and see what he does. Okay. Um, but yeah, um, uh, uh, I mean, don't underestimate the ambition of Tory MPs to be PM. People say, yeah, well, I wouldn't. would Pretty, would she really want it? Because, you know, they're bound to lose. She'd only be PM for a few months. You know, what would be the point? She'd have to fall on her sword if they lost that election, if she right. was the leader. Uh, but but now don't underestimate their ambition to become prime minister. However, her, just to get however it in brief, the books and still books. longer Obviously, than Liz Truss, they'll have achieved their ambition. That's why they're in politics. Do you think she could still beat Liz Truss and be like, "I think that's why now they got trust now." So as long as they beat her, they won't be the shortest yeah, in history. Yeah, so that, that, yeah, well, they made the worst short, wasn't it? That guy that died. But um, I think. But what about lastly on this? I just remembered. What about Obama? visiting Rishi what did you think was that suspect or was that just normal he was just in town I was trying to imagine what um, James Dellingpole's read <laughs> would be what would be the kind of yeah. deep into the rabbit hole conspiracy theory about that and I guess it would be that you know um, the kind of billionaire lizard puppet masters um, uh, like Bill Gates um, had, had seen that Rishi one of their kind of placemen um, uh, was think was wobbling and possibly about to fall on his sword uh, and they didn't want that to happen, so they sent in Obama as a kind of emissary to kind of shore up Rishi and kind of you know stiffen his backbone and dissuade him from kind of resigning. Well, I'm always reluctant to say anything about James because one of his fans will find it and tell him, and then he'll attack you on probably you more than me on X, but uh, he'll call you a cuck. But I did, actually, Lawrence Fox wrote a post very much on the lines of what you're saying that you know Rishi was probably just there, but it was a kind of imagined funny post about okay. the kind of things he would have said to him and you know you've got to sort yourself out mate and along those lines you know you're right. letting down right. the new world order sort of thing yeah he could have just been in town it's a bit weird people are going very conspiracy crazy this week and we'll talk about that later with kate but um our beloved princess but i'm turning out to be a normie because i'm i just think probably obama and it's a bit weird i mean he's not even in power why is he going and chatting to rishi but i don't know i mean may, 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 maybe i mean it's it's possible i suppose that um i mean i don't think Obama was, you know, an emissary for the kind of our lizard overlords. Um, I'm not a WEF conspiracy theorist, uh, but it's possible they might have had a conversation about, you know, if you were to resign now, Rishi, rather than hang on until November, it might reflect badly on people of colour in leadership positions in Western politics. Wow. You know, you have a duty to other politicians of colour to stay in office as long as you can and and not seem like, you know, it was all a disaster and you fell on your sword even before you were turfed out in a general election. It would be better to hang on, see this crisis out, stay as PM for as long as you can, because that would be good for our team. 
So you've avoided, uh, you wanted to avoid conspiracies, and you've just come up with sort of <laughs> racial conspiracy theory. <laughs> it's kind of worse. But I'd, I'm, I'm disavowing that. Um, though speaking of that kind of thing, maybe we should get on to Vaughan Getting. Getting? I don't know how you pronounce it. I mean, it's Wales. I've got no idea. But he has become the Welsh First Minister, and he was voted in by the Labour members. So it's another person kind of not really properly voted in. He got 51.7% of the vote. I mean, at least he won with the members more than Sunak's done. And everyone's saying it's an amazing important thing because he's not white basically they're saying oh, it's the first black leader in europe and it's this is all very significant and uh i'm not sure if it is or not but and some people are listing all the sort of leaders now we've got sunak we've got humza yusuf we've got vaughan thingy so now it's like no no white people anyway and some people have been openly bragging about this there was that post from uh nazir afzal i don't know if you've got it toby i i'm i can't find it now but he he was openly boasting about this saying that there'll be no non-white leaders and he then said representation matters well, actions matter more and i looked at the text of it and i posted it if, if i posted the exact words of this possibly minus the bit where he congratulated him i could probably go to prison for two years because it sounds like it's like it's like yeah we action matters and representation there's no white men it was a kind of weird bragging about it yeah it was odd yet yeah, no, no 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 white men because he included the new leader um, in Northern Ireland, who is white, but a woman. Um, so he was including her in pointing out that now none of the constituent nations in the United Kingdom um, are led by um, white men. And this was a kind of milestone. Um, but it was odd that he put at the bottom of his tweet, representation matters, actions matter more. Um, I mean, because it was like, um, well, if representation matters... Um, isn't it a bit odd that in a country which is still, you know, uh, United Kingdom is still, as far as I know, about 83% white. Yeah. Well, who are they being represented by? I mean, it was odd saying it, if representation matters, why are you celebrating the fact that the majority population is now, according to your terms, unrepresented? But I guess he meant that it matters that non-white men are being represented now politically in the various nations in the United Kingdom, but what really matters is what they do with their with their you know whilst in power. Actions matter more than just yeah. representation, which presumably would be more sort of attacks on white people. I mean, the way you phrase it. So here it is: with Vaughan Gething becoming first Prime Minister of Wales, congrats by the way, and Humza Yusuf first Minister of Scotland, and Rishi Sunak PM, and Michelle O'Neill as first Minister of Northern Ireland, there are now no white men leading the countries of the United Kingdom. Representation matters. Action matters more. Actions matter more. It's a, it's a weird, weird, but disturbing post. He, he was, interestingly, one of the leaders of the pile-on um, uh, onto me when I was appointed to the Office for Students in 2018, when I got cancelled. Um, he, he, he was leading the charge, tweeting that I was a completely unsuitable person to serve as a non-executive director on this new higher education regulator in England, why did Theresa May appoint me? It was just, you know, jobs for the boys, the Tory chumocracy at work. Et cetera, et cetera. Okay, so he said some good stuff as well. As well. But it turned out he'd applied for exactly the same role. Oh, really? I'd got it and he hadn't. So he was absolutely furious about that. That's why he's obsessed with representation. <laughs> he's like, There's, they, sh they shouldn't all go to Toby Young's. So he just sees you as the kind of white man taking all the roles. But then you got you lost that role when you got cancelled. Yeah, but then he, did he step him. in. <laughs> he probably petitioned together, didn't he? He probably set off his CV again. Wow. And um, and Callum uh, from Lotus has said, the last white men in charge of British territory, Chief Minister of Gibraltar, Fabian Picardo, Chief Executive of the Falkland Islands, Andy Keeling, that's all. But you were disputing this. Well, yeah, I think he, he, he was conflating um, British overseas territories with British Crown dependencies. Though I think both Gibraltar and the Falkland Islands are um, British overseas territories. But Malta is... Um, uh, uh, no, wait, wait a minute. I think I think um, the Isle of Man. You brought the Isle of Man. In. Well, because someone replied to it, that, added that, the Isle of is, Man. That, there's okay. British. There's obviously these territories. That, that and there's crown, crown dependencies. Like yeah. No one cares, about Toby. And Jersey uh, about these details. But if but. you're throwing in, if you're throwing in the Isle of Man, then you should probably include. Guernsey and Jersey. Who may, I don't know. Callum didn't mention the other male leaders as well. He just mentioned Gibraltar and Falklands. And it would be kind of weird if you ended up, you could easily have this kind of Britain, a kind of Epcot Centre version of Britain that exists in Gibraltar. Do you know what I mean? Where you still have like white politicians and fish and chips and stuff. And then over here, we, do, we still, it's just like Islamic rule. 
which we could talk about. But did you see that? This is a, a sidebar. But did you see that um, thing in King's Cross uh, today? Of the uh, this is breaking news. The, the K- King's Cross main concourse oh, yeah. had this day nine Fajir. I don't know how you say it. Magri. I don't know how you say it. Hadith of the day. The Prophet Muhammad. Anyways, I don't know. What, I'm scared to even say it. But it talks about Muhammad. All the sons of Adam are sinners, but the best of the sinners are those who repent often. It's displayed on King's Cross. So I, I was rereading um, Michelle Welbeck's submission for a Substack post. I just read it right, again. Right. And he talks about how quickly Islam takes over. But even he didn't pre- – because at least in that book, they have an election. You mm-hmm. know what I mean? And then quickly everyone's wearing – women are wearing long trousers and stuff like this. And, and it all happens very quickly. But I'm like, that's, that's like submission. We've already lost and it's being displayed at King's Cross. And will we submit even more meekly than in the book because they didn't even have an election? Yeah. Is that new though? You quite often see kind of various kind of religious – maxims um on tube stations on whiteboards i mean you rarely admittedly rarely see quotes from the bible yeah. um or the torah but um you 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 you, you do see things like uh, from the tao and little buddhist maxims and stuff like that on the so it's not it's not a completely unprecedented step that's been taken it's not a rubicon crossing <laughs> moment i don't think during lent having a a a, a islamic message on king cross uh, king cross's main concourse i don't know toby but but also the sons of adam are all sinners that mm. sounded almost catholic to me and the, the, the well they the recognize which is people is not who is the greatest sinner but who repents more often for their sins that that could easily be a catholic precept couldn't it well Islam does recognize, you know, some of the same people, doesn't it? Jesus is recognized as a prophet in Islam, just not the son of God. So there are some crossovers. But is that the argument you're making that, hey, it's an Abrahamic Luther, guys. Why don't we all just convert? This is what you're doing for it. Uh, it, 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 it you're it, the new Andrew Tate. It, 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 I wonder if I wonder if when they select. I mean, the, the sex message, trafficking part. They, they thought about, you know, choosing a message that was unlikely to be rejected by, you know, Christians. Um, I see. So fudging it, fudging it a bit, yeah. So getting it in like that. That's how they'll start, Toby. Then suddenly the the hijabs come on. It's great for us. We get why I've read the book. We get wives. That's we get, true. We get funding well, that, from Saudi Arabia. That was one of the interesting <laughs> twists, wasn't it? In in submission, is that actually for the kind of um, the the uh, middle aged bloke, the, the middle aged <laughs> academic um, uh, who, who was the kind of central character. It actually turned out pretty good for him. Crushing. Like he, he was like, you know, it's actually he gets more than one wife, and he, he they offered him a salary, you know, a bet, a better living conditions than he'd had previously. I mean, they're, 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 you know, to buy off the kind of potential in- dissenters within the intellectual class, they were offering them a pretty good deal. Yes, but it is a kind of comically rosy version of it because he's kind of being satirical. He's off, you know, the economy is fixed, and there's going to be a new Roman Empire. So the reality of it probably won't be that good. But still, you're right. We'd be all right. We'd probably be all right. <laughs> You know, we get a couple of. I'm sure you don't want another wife, Toby, but obviously I could do with the, the, the three wives. <laughs> It'd be great. Right. Um, <laughs> so, okay, well, that's. I don't know how that's for getting. I mean, do you, do you have any thoughts on just briefly on him coming in? Is it? I mean, well, he's gonna. Is, can he be any worse than Drake? For well, um, well, I, I, two things to say. The first is that um, uh, his record in office as um, the health minister in Wales uh, during the pandemic was absolutely terrible. I mean. Very few people are focusing on this. They're celebrating the fact that, you know, he's the first black um, uh, political leader of a country in Europe. Um, uh, But they're they're overlooking the fact that actually in his previous role as the Welsh Health Minister during the pandemic, he was, uh, you know, he he was he was pretty poor. Um, So um, it was even slower. Wales was even slower to introduce COVID testing than Matt Hancock was. Um, So plenty of people... Um, who were um, uh, positive were discharged from hospitals back into Welsh care homes, um, which resulted in the kind of um, uh, epidemic of COVID deaths in care homes in Wales. Um, and um, in addition, um, uh, when he was um, he, he was he was interviewed before the COVID inquiry last week, and he said he hadn't even read the 2016 report in which they'd kind of war game what would happen if a pandemic broke out in contemporary Britain. His excuse was that um, it was a Public Health England document, and therefore he didn't think it applied to Wales, but actually it did apply to Wales. The devolved public health authorities were included in the scenarios it considered. Um, uh, in his he, defence, apparently he can't read. He's just, he's just there for diversity representation, <laughs> but he can't actually we, we, carry on. We, he can read because he, <laughs> he, he did... 
he 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 he's a he's a frequent user of WhatsApp, but right. funny enough, turned out he deleted all his WhatsApp messages. I think he said they disappeared during a security rebuild of his work phone. Um, mm -hmm. So that's a bit dodgy. And finally, um, he was actually caught eating fish and chips, I think, in a seaside town with his kids during one of the Welsh lockdowns. Well, he claimed that was within the rules. And he actually complained to Ipso about the fact that The Sun had reported this story, said it was an invasion of privacy, and Ipso did not uphold the complaint. Um, so, yeah... Not not a not a politician with a great track record. Um, right, hasn't seemed to have stopped him becoming first minister. I guess the bar's pretty low if Mark Drakeford's your predecessor. But the other thing I wanted to say was something positive, which is that you know um, uh, it's difficult to to to, to characterise the United Kingdom as a systemically racist country, where if you're a person of colour, you're always going to be treated as a second class citizen and never have the same opportunities as white men like us. It's it's harder and harder to maintain that woke caricature of contemporary Britain if now all four constituent nations of the United Kingdom are not led by white men. So there is that you, know, mm. you, you may think it's kind of um not something to be celebrated, but it certainly gives us a really powerful counter argument when the Wokies try and characterize Britain as you know this kind of racist hellhole yeah although they still will manage to there was an interview with Hamza Yusuf where he, he talked about the the, he, the headline was Tories of colour which I thought was a funny new phrase but he didn't actually use that phrase that was just in the headline but he's saying the problem is they, these people pull up the ladder after them so he's still going to try and imply that there's these people of colour at the top of which he is one but they pull up the ladder so they'll still sort of somehow try and claim some sort of oppression but yeah it is strange isn't it when people point out Hamza Yusuf not elected properly and came in after Sturgeon, not elected by the people. Rishi Sunak not elected even by the members, getting only elected by the members. I don't know about the Northern Ireland woman, don't really no, care. She wasn't, she, she not elected. elected. So, so, people, so people say, look, That's none of these people are elected. So what is this obsession? There's an obsession with diversity. It's clearly an agenda. Obviously, they try and make you sound racist if you start talking about it, but it is a bit odd that they felt the need to parachute in these people and... I don't know. I mean, it's pretty. I was going to say, what's it all about? But I suppose on the face of it, it's quite clear what it's about. It's about an obsession with diversity at the expense of the uh, voter who becomes irrelevant. Although, funnily enough, we'll, we will finally get a white man back with old uh, Starmer. Well, um, yeah, I, I don't know whether the reason, um, you know, um, getting Vaughan Getting has become the leader, the first minister of Wales, is, is he. I don't know. Has he benefited from, you know, diversity policies? I don't know. It could be that, um, you know, it's just he, 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 he's the best of a very bad bunch. I mean, it's probably, you know, the, 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 the Welsh Labour politicians, as I imagine, a pretty shallow talent pool. Yes. And we don't have to be particularly good. To Lakeford kind of was awful. Sorry. Yeah, Lakeford, Lakeford was awful. awful. But I suppose in, even in the voting itself, you know, one person has been writing to me saying, oh, Toby keeps... Bigging up Kemi, but she's part of the uh, diversity A-list stuff. She's not a proper candidate. So you can argue even that in itself, you know, even though it's voted by the members, the members are all thinking along the like, oh, we need someone diverse. So you see what I mean? So even that is the same. It's not just the best. How do you know? It's impossible to know. Is it? This is the problem with, with this whole obsession with diversity. It's impossible to know if they're any good. Because if we had a meritocracy, it'd just be, yeah, okay, they're the best person, but no one thinks that anymore. So everyone immediately goes, well, why have they been hired? Well, I think in... in Kemi's case, she's proved that she is, you know, nobody's diversity hire, um, not least because she's been extremely critical of things like critical race theory, you know, in the House of Commons um, and done her best, I think, to kind of root out kind of wokery pokery um, within government in the brief time she's been in government. Um, but um, I mean, one, one argument against Kemi um, becoming leader of the party is that actually Britain still is you know, too racist to vote for um, a black political leader. Um, and, you know, they, they, they might point to the fact that all these non-white, non-male political leaders, I, mean, I guess it doesn't refer to Northern Ireland, but, but like, you know, they, they'd say they wouldn't have actually won elections because actually, you know, um, the British people are, you know, uh, many of them too racist to vote for a party led by you know, a black person or a Muslim person. Um, uh, but I don't think that's true. I don't think that um, Kemi being black would in any way be an electoral handicap if she became the leader of the Conservative Party and led the party into the general election. I really don't think no. the British electorate, the 
vast majorities see color. No, no, they wouldn't care if, if she was anti woke. Yeah, you know, that's the thing that the Remainer types try and tell me, and I say, well, that's weird because all the people on the right of the party I know prefer Kemi as their candidate, or most of them do. So, yeah, that's obviously not not an issue. But it's the kind of thing they'll use against the the right. Very anyway, uh, not that the Tories are the right, but that's a whole other discussion. So, should we get on to this? Uh, speaking of Hamza of Yusuf, everything's linked today. Let's go on to this Scottish hate crime law. Obviously, you're going to know tons about this, Toby in your usual Toby S detail, but the broad strokes are it's coming in April 1st and it's going to bring in a dystopia. And there's walk-in snitching centres in sex shops. That was one highlight. There's also they're targeting plays specifically. So you won't be exempt if, you, if you're performing a play. I'll just give you some of the... Some of the like him, Ian Chong had a... Whatever you think to him, he had a quite useful ex post on it, which uh, Elon Musk replied to saying we need to protect free speech. And he said, police officers in Scotland are being given training to target social media posts including retweets of material deemed threatening and abusive. Under the country's new hate crime law, actors and comedians are not given a free pass to make jokes about sensitive subjects that offend people either. The new training, uh, which was leaked to the Herald, requires people, police officers, to go after anyone who produces material deemed threatening and abusive, which can be communicated through public performance of a play. So, you know, Edinburgh Fringe is in trouble, comedians are in trouble, and there's way more to it than that. And I'll just quickly add as well, this extremely ridiculous thing, the hate monster which we covered on GB. This is the kind of friendly face of Scottish authoritarianism. Have you met the hate monster? And he's a weird little guy who looks a bit like... Uh, Harry's so, pepperoni. Yeah, or he looks like um, Pound shot, the cookie Sesame monster. Street. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But he's the hate monster. And he says, he says the hate monster represents that feeling that some people get when they're frustrated and angry and take it out on others because they feel like they need to show they're better than them. In other words, they commit a hate crime. The hate monster loves it when you get angry. He weighs you down till you end up targeting someone just because they look or act different to you. When you're feeling insecure or angry, the hate monster feeds on that. It's the key bit. Why do some people let the hate monster in? We know that young men aged 18 to 30 are most likely to commit hate crime, particularly those from socially excluded communities who are heavily influenced by their peers, working class men. What, what colour are these men? Well, let's find out. They may have deep-rooted feelings of being socially and economically disadvantaged combined with ideas about white male entitlement. So poor white men who are somehow also entitled are the ones that are in trouble. So immediately the hate monster commits a hate crime against white men. Toby, it doesn't, it doesn't add up. What am I missing? Well, clearly um, uh, the first thing an opponent of this new law in Scotland should do is walk into one of these the sex hate crime reporting centres and report the hate monster as a hate criminal because yeah. he's essentially saying that um, working class white Boys, men, young men, are much more likely to commit hate crimes, which under under the, under the new kind of very broad definition of a hate crime, um, uh, um, could I think qualify yeah. as a hate crime? They're pretty so, much walking hate crimes. The first just being young white white men. Police Scotland have said they're going to introduce, or they're sorry, they're going to investigate all of the complaints made right. at these. However absurd. However absurd. <laughs> however obviously vexatious. Um, they're going to they're investigate every single one. So if you make a complaint against Police Scotland, they would have to investigate themselves. Um, uh, uh, I mean, it, 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 the, the, the fact that they've located one of these um, uh, third party reporting centres in a sex shop and not just any sex shop. It's um, a sex shop called um, uh, Luke and Jack's. And it describes itself as passionate purveyors of pleasure products. But it's aimed at the LGBTQ community. So it's a sex shop catering to that particular niche. Mm. Um, and do you think they've, um, uh, at, at, which suggests that, that, that some de- it's not an oversight, some deliberation has taken place here. They think, well, if this shop is frequented by members of the LGBT community looking to buy right. sex products, then it's quite a convenient place to put a hate crime reporting centre because they're more likely to be the victims of hate yeah. crimes than While they're there, groups. you get your dildo, stick in a hate complaint, boom, two birds with one stone. I don't right? know if I, what, what's unclear to me is whether you'll be expected to report the hate crimes to the people actually working behind the counter in the shop, whether there'll be other third-party kind of um, officials who'll be kind of who, who are employed... Yeah. Just to record yeah. the hate crime. Reports. Do you think you go into the back like the old days, like you go into a little booth that about just come to report a hate crime, and you just kind of whisper it, and they go in the back, sir, and you go through, and you're in it, 
a little curtain comes across and you report your hate crime in a booth. Whereas obviously out in front, you can just openly do anything you yeah. want because we're in the culture we're in now. Was it a hate crime? So <laughs> yeah. It's not a yeah. Yeah. <laughs> a sort of old Kingsley Avis sort of thing, just in there, just men in overcoats. Just, just from Kent report a hate crime. Yeah, I don't know. That's, 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 that's weird, isn't it? That's, that's, Come yeah, for the sex toys, stay for the hate crime. It's reporting. It, it's, I don't know. It, I think this is, um, I mean, what's curious about this is mm. that I mean, that's curious enough, isn't it, on its own? It's curious. I mean, but, 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 but one thing that really struck me is that, um, you know, Scotland's Hate Crime and Public Order Act is uh, an unbelievably puritanical piece of legislation. It's designed to cleanse Scotland of people who don't conform to kind of contemporary quasi-religious woke dogma. I mean, it, 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 it's worse than, you know, um, uh, the Kirk was more puritanical, more judgy. You know, people are going to be excommunicated in the way that they would have been if they'd been divorcees or you know, in the past. Um, uh, and it's like Scotland has now become I mean, this kind of surge of new puritanism goes hand in hand with an extraordinary licentiousness when it comes to sex and sexual orientation, and and it's sort of and and, and nothing could kind of um, more perfectly illustrate that kind of weird paradox that 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 Scotland like other countries like Ireland has become unbelievably puritanical in one respect as it's become much less puritanical in another um, as kind of the established religion has kind of receded so it's become much more permissive when it comes to sex and gender yeah. and sexual orientation but much less permissive when it comes to diversity of thought it was uh, I, I, um, I, I coined what I called Young's first law in a piece of the Spectator, actually about there we go. about Ireland, which is the more progressive a country is when it comes to sex and gender, the more authoritarian it is when it comes to speech and language. And nothing could be a better illustration of that than locating a third party hate crime reporting centre in a sex shop for LGBT people. In Glasgow, it just perfectly You're captures right. that <clears throat> weird paradox of contemporary woke society. That is the apotheosis of Young's Law. That is perfect. It is great. But, but, but you sound like every um, Peter Hitchens book. I mean, I'm listening to the Cameron Delusion now. I've already listened to the Abolition of Britain, Rage Against God. That's, that's that's the theme of all his books with the liberal, the liberal hegemony, the liberal fascism. That's that's how it works, isn't it? And we see more and more the clamp down, the attempt to use authoritarianism or sort of a soft authoritarianism to. To ensure the liberal hegemony, we see it, we see it in the IFD being pushed out in Germany. Maybe it's happening in Holland with the the Hurt Wilders isn't allowed to lead. Maybe that's just party politics. I'm not sure, but we just see this more and more. We see it in Canada. We now we're seeing it very explicitly in Scotland. This is just going to be the theme, isn't it? And it's only going to be much worse under Starmer. Yeah. Um, uh, Here's a little paradox. Starmer's going to bring in euthanasia. He said he'll legalize the, the uh, euthanasia, essentially assisted dying, mm. but. The kind of people that do that would be very against the death penalty. Isn't that another kind of liberal paradox? They wouldn't want the death penalty for, for murderers and rapists, but they would want that you to be you to be able to be killed just because your your fibromyalgia is playing up. Which yeah. was in a real example from yeah. Canada, a forty one year old said, "Oh, my fibro, fibromyalgia is playing up." You know the real reason she told friends in private she was poor, mm-hmm. so they offed her because she was poor. For, well, this is what's coming in with labour. Yeah, um, uh, and already exists, of course, in Canada, where they're introducing this unbelievably draconian anti-hate speech law called the Online um, Harms Bill. Yeah. Um, and as we discussed, I think, last week, under the Online Harms Bill, if the police just think you're going to say something hateful on social media, even if you haven't, um, they can place you under house arrest and kind of remove all your devices. Um, but also, if you do say something that breaches this law on social media, you can be imprisoned for life. And you can also be bankrupted because people who are have been triggered by supposedly hateful things you've said on social media can sue you for up to twenty thousand um, dollars, and there's no limit on the number of people that can sue you for twenty thousand dollars. So you can imagine in Canada, people, you know, you can imagine the Mounties kind of um, pulling up on your doorstep and saying, "Sir, you know, we're going to place you under house arrest. We already have enough evidence to put you in prison for life." And there's about 20 people all suing you for 20,000 Canadian dollars. And in all likelihood, they'll win. But we do have this euthanasia program. I mean, it, it does feel a bit like yeah, that, doesn't it? It's unbelievable. I mean, it's, 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 no, one, no one predicted that the dystopia would come in via Mounties, did they? That's one surprise. <laughs> did they come with the cattle project? Remember, remember the Mountie in WWF? Maybe you're the wrong era. Did you ever watch the wrestling back in the day? The Mountie had a cattle prod as a secret weapon. When the ref wasn't looking, he goes, he had a good song. I am the Mountie. Do you remember any of this? No. Okay, 
Um, the point is, that law is beyond parody because it's minority report, future crime. Toby, you might commit, if we've looked at your profile, and you might commit a future hate crime. So we're just going to keep you in your house, under house arrest. Isn't that just beyond, or how can it's, you even parody well, that? And it, as you say, it's, it's part of a kind of trend within progressive controlled Western liberal democracies. It isn't just Scotland. It isn't just Ireland. Um, it isn't just Canada. It's also true of Poland. Um, so Donald Tusk, who is the progressive new prime minister in Poland, is um, waging a kind of jihad against the Law and Justice Party. Um, and even the, it, 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 the judiciary, the president, I mean, he's breaching all these democratic norms in order to kind of cleanse the public square of the political opponents he's just defeated in a way which is, you know, raising eyebrows even amongst some of his kind of progressive fellow travellers. N.S. Lyons, um, this um, substacker who writes a lot about um, the fragility of democracy and the degeneration of liberal democratic societies into these kind of totalitarian dystopias. Um, he, he's written a really good couple of posts now about what's happening in Poland specifically, where it seems to be even worse than what's about to happen in Canada. That seems to be where, you know, that seems to be the apotheosis of this new right. trend. That, you know, of course, you know, um, Aristotle warned that uh, one of the shortcomings of democracy um, is that it can easily degenerate into a kind of um, uh, despotic, demagogue-led dictatorship. And mm. that seems to be, you know, what's, ha what's happening kind of yeah. across the West. I think there's always a tension between, we talk about liberal democracy, but the two are not necessarily uh, on, on board with each other. There are odds, aren't they? Because it's to maintain liberalism. You sometimes have to get rid of the democracy. Like Brexit, if it goes the wrong way, you have to try and overturn it. And numerous other examples, you get the wrong prime minister, you get rid of it, you get the members vote in another one, you get rid of her. We see so many examples now, IFD in Germany, it's, the democracy part is out the window if it threatens the liberal part. And then, of course, you go, what does liberalism even mean in that context? Weirdly, we've got to move on from this, but Trump might be the exception if there's a fair election. Trump might be the exception because he's winning so massively and they seem to have accepted him. And I wonder why that's happening if they just can't stop it or if the deep states kind of accommodated him and it will be a kind of more liberal kind of centrist thing. But he does seem to be bucking that trend. Well, I mean, I think the the fear is that um, Trump, if he wins, will also govern in quite a, an authoritarian. Be yeah, that's the whole way, <laughs> and and, and so it wouldn't, it wouldn't be an, it wouldn't it wouldn't be it wouldn't be the kind of alternative to progressive totalitarianism that we're yearning for. It would be actually kind of uh, more like something reminiscent of authoritarianism of old from the mid 20th century do you really believe that though i mean i hope so but what will actually happen is trump will be the most he's trump's a liberal he'll be the most liberal centrist candidate and he'll be mates with tucker and musk and things like that it will be a kind of liberal centrist uh free well, market e still pro-immigration party I, I, I think, think well i guess i imagine that the argument will be um if trump has to kind of use all the powers conferred on him as president in order to try and rein in some of the excesses of the kind of progressive authoritarians, um, uh, such as, you know, um, defunding some universities for kind of um, uh, introducing affirmative action policies, which penalize white applicants. You know, if he has to use all the powers of his office, political power, state power, in order to uh, defeat his authoritarian but progressive political opponents, he'll be accused of being authoritarian. So then the argument will be, is it? can you justifiably kind of overreach as president in order to rein in what are these kind of unbelievably authoritarian but progressive civil institutions like universities, like the media, like social media? Well, if you believe elite theory, uh, as I was discussing with the academic agent on my other podcast, The Current Thing, Nima Parvini, you, you find that all, all we have is an elite replaced by a counter-elite so all I can hope for is that the counter elite of Trump is much more aligned with me. But we're not, but we're not getting that in anywhere in Europe. What I was going to say there as well, they've tried to get Trump with lawfare. So it's not that they haven't tried to do the same thing they're doing across Europe, but they haven't got him. That's what's so interesting. I mean, why have they not managed to get him? Well, let's see if in the election, maybe they still managed to stitch it up. But it's just interesting that he's he might have just beaten that. Maybe with the sheer force of Trumpian character because we the sort of same themes. Don't, but also, America's a more free country. But... Um, but he, yeah, but Trump's basically a liberal, except for the Supreme Court 
he managed to pack, he managed to get his, the conservatives into the Supreme Court. So the abortion thing went through. So there are these sort of socially conservative things that are kind of at odds with Trump's natural instincts to make him more conservative. But I think basically, I think you will you, you, Trump will be aligned with your kind of things. He'll be a kind of liberal, free speech, classical liberal type of leader. I think. Anyway, that's no, so. A um, couple of other points on okay. this um, Scottish hate crime stuff. All right. um, uh, just quickly, um, the poster girl for the new um, uh, SNP's new hate crime laws, someone called Lindsay Taylor, um, who um, has featured on videos on the Scottish government website because she claims to be and may well be the victim of, quote unquote, Islamophobic attacks. And she talks about how that's made her feel and how she's been spat at on the street and so on and so forth. Um, and this is intended to raise awareness amongst kind of ordinary Scots of just how prevalent and how um, harmful hate crime can be and why these new laws are important, why people should go to sex shops to report hate crimes and so forth. Turns out she actually works for um, uh, an organization called MEND, Muslim Engagement and Development, um, which, as you would expect, are um, uh, quite extremist in various respects. Um, they're actually named by Michael Gove as uh, the kind of group that would be kind of quasi banned by his new definition of extremism, though they haven't been quasi banned yet. But he singled them out. He named five groups and MEND uh, was one of them. And he described them in Parliament as Islamist. And um, but this, I think, just, you know, tells us what we already knew, which is that hate speech directed towards Jews will not be considered a hate crime uh, in contemporary Scotland, but hate speech directed toward, towards Muslims will. Um, there's this ex-head of the Scottish Police Federation, Callum Steele, who's emerged as, a, as, as one of the most forthright and um, articulate critics of this new um, hate crime legislation. He's made a number of good points. One point he made was that, you know, if, if the Scottish police have said not only will they investigate every single report of a hate crime, um, even if it's transparently obvious that it doesn't meet the threshold for a criminal offence, even under this new law, um, they, they, will they will investigate everyone and they'll record everyone as a hate incident, open bracket, non-crime, which is the Scottish version of a non-crime hate incident. And this guy Callum's pointed out that, you know, within a very few months, given the huge number of reports that the police will investigate and record, as hate incidents, Scotland will soon be established, you know, across the world as the most hate filled country in the world. I mean, the data will suggest that Scotland is just full of hatred. Everyone, I mean, kind of like 10 percent of the population will have a kind of hate incident, you know, recorded against their name in Scotland. To be honest, when, when I've been there, it has felt fairly full of hatred <laughs> because I'm English Could and be. it's the Edinburgh Fringe and they're all, they're all drinking. But um, that, yeah, Scotland, the, the world's capital of hate. All right. Hold well, on, one last point. Yeah, um, it's quick. The, We've got to get to Pete. We've got to do it Ofcom as well. This guy, um, uh, Callum Steele, he he made, I thought, a really good point about the um, uh, the hate monster. Um, he said, um, "Hang on a second, let me just." Uh, he said, "Yeah." He said, um, uh, "Never forget, there would have been meetings, many meetings, and committees, and focus groups, and all other manner of things where this concept was born, nurtured, and finessed before being agreed." For release into the world, and one of the kind of um, one of the one of the most I think pointed things about the SNP Police Scotland, the rollout of this new law on April first. I mean, every aspect of it, from the hate monster, the appointment of this Islamist as a kind of spokesperson, um, uh, uh, the creation of the hate monster, the sex shops, it all suggests a kind of level of of midwittery, which is kind of, which is startling. You know, yeah. the people behind all this, our new masters, our would-be oppressors are all unbelievably kind of midwitted and mediocre. And you feel like, is, is it kind of the revenge of the talent list, the also run, you know, on, on the more talented, the more colourful, the eccentric, the kind of, uh, the more vivid characters? But it feels that way, like in, and that was one of the characteristics of, living in Soviet Russia, which dissident writers used to complain about. They used to complain that the writers who, who were approved by the regime and who were devising, you know, who were handing out grants to each other and making sure that they didn't get 
any grants at all. It was like the worst thing about it was that the, the, the people now in charge, the people calling the shots, the people making your lives a misery were all unbelievable mediocrities, people you were just clearly you know, much more talented there. I mean, do you think a, you see yeah. that in comedy? Don't yeah, you? Yeah. People kind of who jump on the cancellation bandwagon are generally the midwits, the, the mediocrities, the Salieri's rather than the Mozarts. And it's the Mozarts that they attack, that they go for. Yes. I mean, I've partly been motivated by jealousy, right? I feel we're personally under attack, Toby. Both of us under that, under being, that premise. Being in the Mozart Being category, genius right? and being an eccentric yeah, genius. Yeah, yeah. This is a big, massive problem for me all my life. Whereas the mediocrities are in there. First, two things quickly. April the 1st makes me think, is it meant to be an able fool or, or make us think that? Second thing, yeah, you've got me thinking, imagine the hate monster meeting. Like, okay, guys, if you can make it a look, bit, look a bit more like the cookie monster, but not to, it, can't have, it can't be the same colour. And can you make it hate white people? Like, I mean, how did that mean? Like you're saying, it must have got through so many layers. Yeah, let's say um, white men 18 to 30, and they have white entitlement. Should we say toxic? No, don't say toxic. Say white entitlement. But it's in Scotland. I was like, what does that mean? And they're like, just stick it down. Just, you know, I mean... It's like the May campaign. It's the same people as in yeah. the May campaign, I reckon. It could easily be the same agency, couldn't it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, they, actually, you, you said people, the in Scotland, monster. people in Scotland may not understand what the hate monster says, but actually they've got the hate monster talking in this kind of thick Glaswegian oh, have they? accent using Glaswegian slang. Yeah, I can't really do the accent, but um, uh, he said, um, yeah, uh, the hate monster, he'll, he'll make you want to have a go at somebody and vent your <laughs> anger. Just because folk look are act different, fair you. Right. From you, fair you. Yeah, you're right about the act. But yeah, yeah, that's not really Glasgow. But yeah, okay. that's extraordinary. Okay. Imagine just sitting through all these hate monster meetings. Yeah. Can and you, being paid. To can we come make up with him a bit stuff? more racist? Yeah, okay, cool. We'll make him hate white people and he's red. No, is that okay? Yeah. And then there's so many people signing off on it. It's, it's, it's madness, isn't it? What can you say? But maybe it is still an April Fool. We can still hold out hope for. For that possibility. I think that's just another thing they overlook because they're so stupid. All right. Well, very much on a similar theme, Toby, let's just do this Ofcom story. So the Ofcom GB News ruling, which I'm sure people have seen, is another direct attack on my workplace, which is pretty annoying. And Ofcom said, we found that two episodes of Jacob Rees-Mogg's State of the Nation, two episodes of Friday Morning with Esther and Phil, and one episode of Saturday Morning with Esther and Phil, broadcast during May and June 2023, failed to comply with rules 5.1, from 5.3 of the hate monster, sorry, of the broadcasting code. So the media watchdog said that because the politicians acted as news readers, news interviewers, or news reporters in sequences that clearly constituted news, including reporting breaking news events, without exceptional justification, news was therefore not presented with due impartiality. And uh, and they go on about a bit bit more about this, but the politicians have an integral, inherently impartial role inside. Blah, blah, blah. It's quite boring. And GB hit back. But maybe I'll just read a little bit of GB saying they said they were deeply concerned by the ruling. They said Ofcom is obliged by law to promote free speech and media plurality and to ensure that alternative voices are heard. In latest decisions, in some cases a year after the program aired, contravene those duties. Extraordinarily, Ofcom has determined that a program which it acknowledges was impartial and lacking in any expression of opinion still somehow breaches its impartiality rules just because an imaginary viewer might think otherwise. So that's the thing. They, they're saying like someone might not find it to be impartial which is an absurd new new standard and i just pointed out as well the whole idea of impartiality is ludicrous it's a blairite scheme introduced to it impose the blair hegemony and we're still in that blairite world in addition to that it now has woke activists pressurizing them all the time to attack gb news how could it possibly be impartial what is this metaphysical standard of impartiality we're in a highly specific culture with a very tight overton window which Ofcom polices. So the idea that it could ever be impartial is ludicrous. But now this, we already, we already knew that already, to be fair. But now this is a kind of a new level of overstepping. Yeah. Well, I was quite surprised by this finding. I mean, the, the, the argument of Ofcom is that if you have serving politicians um, acting as news readers, like reading out breaking news reports, um, or in, in their links, you know, purporting to be politically neutral, impartial reporters of the news, uh, when they are in fact elected politicians, that's a breach of the broadcasting code because um, it's a breach of the broadcasting code for people who are politically partisan to kind of pose as impartial, neutral, under that cover. Mm -hmm. Um, But what's odd about that um, is that, uh, well, first of all, I thought GB News had effectively got around that by having um, newscasters 
yes. read the news headlines, the bulletins, you know, yeah. the bulletins in between shows. So a show can be presented by Jacob or Esther and Phil, but they're not reading the news. That's done by somebody else in a different studio. Uh, but I guess when there's breaking news, then they do sometimes have to read the news or they kind of talk about the news in a kind of news readery idiom anyway from time to time. And that seems to have been what's got them into trouble here. But what's odd about it, as you say, is that um, lots of other, you know, um, channels commit precisely the same sin under the pretext of being impartial and non-partisan. LBC with one. In people get partisan views. Yeah, LBC uh, the, with David Lammy and all these people as well. They have the politicians as well. Yeah. David Lammy, Angela Rayner. Uh, 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 maybe, maybe, maybe it's partly because... LBC has more of a balance of politicians, you know, from, but I guess they're not serving. Are they, are David, does David Amy actually have a show? I don't know if it was like one of those temporary shows. You know, people used to host temporarily. But people were sharing. Another example, I got a, an example here, which was reported in The Spectator today, which was when the BBC uh, was writing about reform recently. It described, it was actually an article about the Lib Dem Spring Conference. They described the Re- Reform UK as a far right political party, yes. which you know, as we all know, is a, is a, is a smear, um, yeah. and not just a factual description of a political yeah. party. Would that they were! It's uh, it was uh, it was yeah. Richard Tice has been talking about that on GB News today as we record, right. saying that you know if they don't if they apologise for it, and he said it is if they don't want to apologise, it's fine. We can, we get the lawyers involved, but I'd rather not do that. So they've I think the BBC has actually apologised for that because they were sufficiently worried about Tice's presumably quite high powered lawyers. Yeah, oh, and this. And you saw presumably the um, Hope Not Hate's latest report, uh, oh, yeah. State of Hate, yes. and um, uh, the the and it, and it was talking about you know how far right hate had kind of metastasized. Yeah, and it was just a big picture here. of you, wasn't it? No, it was actually it was well, well I was, <laughs> was going to say um, on 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 almost the front page of this report there was a big picture of Nigel Farage yeah. and also a big picture of Jacob, a slightly smaller picture of Jacob. And Lee Anderson. So, yes. of and Danny the, Kruger of the, was in of the, there. Danny Kruger and Miriam Miriam Cates. Cates. Pretty tell. But of the six people, you know, the poster people for this kind of far right, kind of authoritarian, ethno nationalist kind of blight on mm-hmm. the nation, three of the six, 50% of them were GB news presenters. I'm surprised your, your picture wasn't there. Yeah, not quite famous enough yet, Toby, to get in that. Oh, but, yeah. and, you, and you scroll down and there's Lawrence, Lawrence Fox. Yeah, Lawrence. Literally no longer a GB News presenter. but Yeah, they've also got a picture of Elon Musk in their little brochure. He's it's somehow him. a yeah. hate figure. He's on page well. five. It's absolutely amazing. I was amazed to hear Josh the other day on the headline as he was saying that Hope Not Hate, you know, sometimes do, do good things. It's like, do they, Josh, like, well, I try and get rid of your job every day. I mean, they're completely obscene and gone. And, and Hope Not Hate, they are actually guilty of the sin which GB News has fa- which which Ofcom has found GB News guilty of. Hope not hate, pose as non-partisan watchdogs. You know that that they, 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 right. they are trying to advance a left-wing radical progressive agenda by demonising anyone who dissents from it as being a hate monger. Oh no, they're just calling out hate on the left and the right. Just so happens that right-wing hatred is a far bigger threat. Than Islamic hatred. Yeah, um, on, on that point, that Sangeeta from LBC was commenting on this, and someone replied to him and said, "Their name is literally Hope Not Hate," and she replied, "Literally." And I was like, "I mean, this is what we're up against." I mean, Carl was like, "Oh, good, then that's the Nazis were officially socialists. We've solved it, guys." Who, no one's ever thought of having a name that doesn't perfectly represent what you actually. We're just hopeful, guys. Really? Because what about my hope of keeping a job? We don't seem to be much worried about that hope. You know, I would hate it if I lost my job to you guys. I would hope not to, but that doesn't seem to really matter to you. I mean, she she posted about this, that Sangeeta said, because Mog was hitting back at Hope Not Hate, he said, Hope Not Hate is a left-wing group that bandies around accusations of extremism in a hateful way. And she said, and so it begins. wasn't clear to me what begins. <laughs> what Jacob Issa Mog says about Hope Not Hate is untrue. Hope Not Hate is one of the most respected organisations in the anti-extremist space. I love the way she makes it sound like a promising tech startup. The anti-extremist mm-hmm. space. It's a new space, though, and it is, isn't it? It's a new, that's a grift. You want to talk about a grift? That is the ultimate grift, is the Hope Not Hate grift. Just trying to get rid of my job every day. These people wake up every day and think, how can I make Nick poorer? Do you know what? On that point, some people said to me, Starmer will get rid of GB News. Do you think Starmer will get rid of GB News? If he did, I'd be so worried about how my hatred would just be uncontainable. This guy, I already hate I this. I should say that's dangerous. You might be, you might be oh, yeah. taken in for questioning. By the hate monster. Well, I mean, <laughs> certainly in Scotland, you couldn't say it. But you don't want to sound like, you know, if GB News has its broadcast license withdrawn by Ofcom, you're going to blame Starmer when you lose your job and you're going to come for him. No, no, That's I'm not going good. to come for him. But I'm saying if Starmer got rid of it, I already hate that we're in this dystopian authoritarian leftist government. 
But then when they start coming for your actual job, but, but some people say to me, he'll do it. I don't think Sam would have the guts to do that. But you said he, he might because it's going to yeah. be an arm's length from him. It wouldn't be if, if you know, be the threat doesn't come from Keir Starmer, at least not directly. It comes from Ofcom, you know, which may, um, if it continually finds GB News guilty of breaching the broadcasting code, withdraw GB News's broadcasting license like it did to Russia today, you know, during when the Ukraine conflict broke out. Um, and uh, that's the danger. But I don't think Keir Starmer would necessarily be implicated in that. He could say, look, the chair of Ofcom, Sir Michael Gray, was appointed um, before I was prime minister by my predecessor, you know, Rishi Sunak. Um, I didn't appoint the chief executive. Um, Lord Gray appointed right. the chief executive. Well, I didn't appoint members of the guidance. board. Yeah. The board was appointed under my predecessors. Um, um, so I think he'd have sufficient insulation um, uh, not to be blamed if that actually happened. You might blame him, but I think he, he could make a decent argument that, you know, no, um, this is just the impartial regulator enforcing the mutually agreed rules. It's not a political decision. How very communist. There's a guy like Stalin would say, yeah, yeah. That- it, would be, it, would be, it would be Starmer doing exactly what Ofcom is accusing GB News of doing, which is, which is doing something quite partisan under the guise of being completely impartial. I know. The, the fact they're so threatened by GB, it is very revealing. And that GB News is doing much better than anyone anticipated. The relentless attacks on it. I mean, this is for being things I've said. Everyone knows this. But it is fascinating to just almost watch them reach this new level of, it's kind of grimly fascinating, this new level of open authoritarianism where just the threats to GB News. You know, in the normal world, they could just leave GB News alone. It would, it would produce what is basically like left liberal content, if you ask me. But I mean, you know, even on GB News, let's remember, we have people like Michael Walker on, we have Navarra Media on, but we can't have Carl Benjamin on, quite strangely, even though the co-owner was alleged to have reposted one of his posts on X. Very strange. We still live in this Overton window that is skewed towards the left. You know, you can have, Carl's quite a moderate figure these days, but you can't have, I think he probably always was, but he was a bit outspoken in the past. Now he's quite moderate. But you have actual communists on there. So we, it, this thing that they're desperate to shut down is actually already a sort of liberal with channel with woke people on it and you should you should actually why don't you issue a complaint complain to ofcom that you think gb news is uh clearly a communist front politically biased to the left yeah masquerading under the guise of complying with the broadcasting code when actually it's pumping out progressive propaganda yeah that would enable them to say well we get complaints from both sides yeah right? Right. 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 i should do that yeah. It's a liberal organization with communist elements. Yeah. That's how I see it. And then occasional people look like me are allowed on. Ash Soccer, but no Carl Benjamin. I think you should investigate. Yeah, check yeah. it out. Um, <laughs> that's a good point. All right. Well, th- those are pretty much our main stories this week. Hopefully people enjoyed our new studio setting. Don't worry, we are going to do Pete Woke. But Toby, do you want to quickly read an advert from one of our loyal sponsors? I will. So Nick did tell me I had to memorize this because I couldn't look at my computer and then look up at the camera. And um, Alex, our producer and the owner of this fantastic facility that we're recording in, he's going to have an auto cue set up in due course, but just not yet. So I'm going to have to read this off my laptop. Uh, it's an ad from um, the Living Care Company. Are you worried about parents or a loved one who are finding it more and more difficult to take care of themselves or who may be living with a condition such as dementia or Parkinson's? Are you starting to think about a residential care home but the very thought of it doesn't sit right. At the Live-In Care Company, we truly believe that home is the best place to receive care from an expert carer of your choice and on a one-to-one basis. Home is always calmer, more healthy, and a happier place to be. For more information about Live-In Care, please go to theliveincarecompany.co.uk. That's all one word, theliveincarecompany.co.uk. Or you can ring them for a no-obligation conversation on 0118-914-5300. That's 0118-914-5300, and they'll be happy to help. All right. Well, those are all our main stories. Thanks for that advert as well. And now let's do everyone's favourite section. It's Peak Woke. So, Toby, as usual, loads of Peak Wokes. Hard to know where to start. I've got a good one here about the countryside, the British countryside, and how it can evoke dark nationalist feelings in paintings, warned museum. This was Cambridge University's Fitzwilliam Institution. The most absurd, one of the most absurd peak works we've ever seen. 
this guy, uh, the museum, it's owned by the University of Cambridge, and there's some guy called Luke Sison. He says, I would love to think there's a way of telling these larger, more inclusive histories that doesn't feel as if it requires a pushback from those who try to suggest that any interest at all in this work is what would now be called woke. But it is actually woke because it said things like the pictures of the rolling English hills can stir feelings of pride towards a homeland. But that was seen as a negative. It said, however, in the gallery uh, displaying a bucolic work by Constable, visitors have informed that there is a darker side to the nationalist feeling evoked by the British countryside. And they're saying that it's, it's this dark, dark nationalism is what it will evoke in you. You'll just see some hills and you'll just immediately feel like you want an ethno state or something. Is that right? I, I, yeah, it's hard to understand exactly what the rationale is, but I think it's that it, if, if, if you feel a sense of kind of pride um, uh, in the English landscape, as evoked by Gainsborough um, and um, uh, who are the other constable. Uh, Con- constable and yeah. Palmer, um, then um, that may, that may that may that that may make you think that more recent arrivals don't belong here for some reason. They don't have the same connection to these bucolic scenes as you do, being a kind of indigenous person. This is kind of like uh, this. This is somehow a vision of Britain. Um, uh, a Britain's countryside, which excludes people of colour. That's the kind of rationale. Because they're, they're famously not allowed in the countryside because the countryside is racist. As soon as they like get, they try and get into the hills and they just repels them like a force field. It, it does feel like you know um, witch finders trying to find evidence of witchcraft everywhere, even in apparently innocent looking objects. I mean, it, 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 this this it's 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 like how can you really detect signs of white supremacy? in a kind of yeah. painting by Constable. It's, it's just... It says, um, lands- like a sign in the gallery actually says, landscape paintings were also always entangled with national identity. The countryside was seen as a direct link to the past and therefore a true reflection of the essence of a nation. Paintings showing rolling English hills or lush French fields reinforce loyalty and pride towards a homeland. The darker side of evoking this nationalist feeling is the implication that only those with a hor- historical tie to the land have a right to belong. That is a heck of a leap. They also talk about Portraits of uniformed and wealthy sitters in the like, like arist- aristocrats became vital tools in reinforcing the social order of a white ruling class. Probably because at that time there was only white people in the country, you know, just different types of white people. I don't know. It's amazing, isn't it? I mean, the portraits were entangled in complex ways with British imperialism and the ins- institution of transatlantic slavery. It's one of those hateful garbage they've come out with yet that the English rolling hills are racist. And Michael Deacon had got a funny piece about this in The Telegraph in which he pointed out that if the Fitzwilliam, if the if the director of the Fitzwilliam really believes that um, you know watercolors of the English countryside can ev- evoke feel- dark feelings of nationalism, um, then why display them at all? You know, surely if they're that dangerous, putting a kind of you know um, a little sticker on um, or putting putting I think they're putting putting them in a particular category, um, uh, you know, uh, called identity. Uh, as though that's going to kind of uh, protect people from having these kind of dark ethno nationalist kind of sentiments yeah. triggered by looking at these paintings. Yeah, they don't. They shouldn't see them at all. I mean, it's too dangerous. It's too dangerous. My concern is what if they accidentally were sort of driving and they got lost and they went too far out of the city and they accidentally saw some actual hills and it immediately became a Nazi. Yeah, you know I mean, maybe, my, this, maybe this is the rationale for that. Maybe that's the rationale for you know um, the Canadian authorities placing potential hate criminals under house arrest. That if they get out of their home and see Snow. the Canadian Rockies, yeah. you know, then they might actually start. They might actually go out and try and kill. Them. Yeah, they'll go out. They'll say, "Oh, this is a rocky mountain. It's all snowy and white. White people. I'm white. That's no state." It's, you see how quickly it happens, to me. <laughs> it's dangerous. The snow to to fascist pipeline really hasn't been explored properly. And it's the same with the rolling hills here. Everyone says touch grass, don't they, on social media? But the second you touch grass, Toby, you become an actual Nazi. Anyway. Hard to top, but do you want to do a quick peak work of your own? Yes. Yeah, so I've got um, uh, dating agencies accused of bringing green dogma into the bedroom. So it's apparently increasingly common um, for dating agencies to ask um, their customers how they feel about um, environmental issues. And you're really not given many choices. Um, so one popular site, eHarmony, asked customers, what do you think about climate change, conservation, renewable energy, et cetera. Like everyone who fills out a profile on eHarmony has to answer this question. And you're only given the choice of answers indicating either A, you, you think that more should be done, or B, you prefer to ignore what's happening. It's too horrible. 
Like <laughs> there isn't C, I think it's balls. That's not an option. Um, you're either apathetic and lazy and prefer to just sweep it all under the carpet because it's too horrible to think about, or you think more should be done. I'd love to see that. Uh, C, it's a control mechanism of the globalist liberal hegemony. You know, you're just in there, it's like, oh, he's a keeper. <laughs> it's, like, it's not going to happen. I've only very briefly looked at those sites, to be honest, because I've given up on women. But I remember seeing uh, the, everyone had their pronouns. All the women, like half the women have their pronouns on there. It's just like an immediate no, isn't it? You're just like, women are, women are so fun. Do you know why that is? Because men have to, qu- have to di- qualify and women have to disqualify. So they're on those apps, there's tons of men and they're just trying to get any woman. There's like, so their profile reads something like, I am a person with thoughts and also feelings. I like going in, but also going out, but also staying in and going in. I like all of it. <laughs> and it's just like, I like the sea, but also the land. It's just like, it's wait, wait, help nothing. I have to you there now. That's, oh, right, good point. Not the rolling hill. <laughs> but they, they say, you know, it's like astrology sign. Yes. You know, they, they're just trying to sort of be the most bland thing possible. Whereas women are trying to bat men away because they're getting so many dick pics in their inbox. We're batting them all away. So they're saying things like, must not be a Jordan Peterson fan. I've seen that one multiple times. That's really? not made up. Yeah, yeah. You just show up at a first day. Well, I saw your thing about you. Yeah, it's over. It's over. And, um, <laughs> so women are trying to disqualify. So they're like, yeah, must not, not like Jordan Peterson. They got their pronouns, which is just a red putting off like 80% of men immediately. Because you always think, why would women want to do that? Like, why do they wear nose rings? These, mis- these are mysteries we don't understand. Anyway. I should have thrown it because be, the nose rings will be furious. I mean, those ones in the middle that look like a cow. No man's ever liked them. Anyway, but they also all have their pronouns on the dating site. So what can you do? They're, they're woke on the face of it. Yeah. I know it's in the climate thing, though. And they increasingly ask you what your political views are as well, because, you know, plenty of their customers don't want to date a Tory. It's like, what happened to right. the old-fashioned idea? You meet someone a little bit different from you, and you have a kind of interesting exchange of views. You might actually learn something. It's like now they want the date, as far as possible, to be like their social media feed, in which it's just an, the person you're dating just <laughs> echoes everything you think and says it back to you. I know that's what I want. Um, <laughs> all right, we don't have much time, but um, constraints of our new setup, guys. But I want to just quickly, very quickly do this one from the BBC. John Ronson and Adam Brooks had had some show where they were just wanking onto each other on the BBC about Graham Linehan, who they described as a, a mutual friend who we don't talk about. So uh, they were basically completely throwing Graham Linehan under the bus, not using his name. And they agreed. Adam Brooks was like, yeah, he wanted to come on the show, but I just didn't think it would be productive. It seemed like a zero-sum game. He doesn't understand the phrase zero-sum game, by the way. And they're all saying Linehan wanted to come on. They, he was friends with him. We wanted to talk about the trans issue. They decided no, but somehow they, they were virtuous in doing this. And it was quite hard to understand why. But John Ronson was saying, people have become obsessed. And I just realized he'd gone really far down the rabbit hole and all this crap. Where somehow, Ron, someone pointed out a good, a good point here. Ronson's own obsession was turned into a BBC docu-series because <laughs> that's like interesting obsession. Whereas Graham Linnan's obsession was sort of mad and wrong and dangerous. Did you see that? I did. I did. I, I saw the, yeah, I saw it was on, on Twitter. Yeah, it was um, disappointing to see someone I've always quite respected um, uh, have so little understanding of where Graham Linnan is coming from. And I would have thought particularly in the week when the NHS have banned puberty blockers. Yeah. You, you might think, instead of thinking he's gone down a rabbit hole, why is he obsessed with this issue? You might think, crikey, he was right about this. Why didn't I listen? Yes. Yeah, absolutely. I, I know, they just look worse and worse as time goes on. But there you go. Like you say, yeah, great writer, John Ronson, read many of his books, but unfortunately, and he did write So You've Been Publicly Shamed, but after that, he got back in his box and went woke and whatever he did, or he went establishment or whatever. Anyway, very sad. Go on. One um, more. I got, okay, but we... So, um... Lloyd Bank um, has um, come up with a list of words that um, uh, it's unacceptable to use in the workplace, uh, which include headless chicken, lost in translation, sold down the river. um, And it's telling its 57,000 employees um, that some of these words may cause offence in the workplace. Better to avoid them. Another one is guinea pig might upset vegans, apparently. Um, if you, you refer to Windows is out. No, no. So, so, so one of the words that they've included on their list of banned inappropriate language to use in the workplace is widow, seemingly overlooking the fact that Lloyd's Bank owns Scottish widows, oh. which is, um, you know, um, uh, 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 it's a, a subsidiary that has 200 billion in assets under management. So seemingly... Lloyd's employees can't even refer to one of their multi-billion pound subsidiaries anymore because its name is part of 
he includes a word on the band list. Right. I'm quite tired. I got woken up early by construction work. I read that as windows. I was thinking, how can windows be bad? But I think it probably is because you see through them to the rolling hills beyond. You know, that, so probably, you know, windows themselves will be out soon. But it was actually widows. Okay. Well, it, 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 you, you want to say something else? I've just got one last one. Okay, is, very quick. Um, uh, in France, they're introducing a new law to make it unlawful to discriminate against people uh, because of their hair in the right. workplace. And this is obviously designed to protect women with blue hair or pink hair <laughs> or women of color who wear braids, uh, right. et cetera, uh, and claim that they're discriminated against in virtue of their hair. But I wonder if it would protect bald men. Um, you know, it could be actually a huge breakthrough um, for the bald. Soon will become baldness will become a protected characteristic. And, you know, we can claim discrimination if we lose a job, but if we're bald. It's turned the rules against them, Toby. This is how you win. You're getting tactical. You're finally getting smart and tactical about it. Yeah, I hadn't heard that one, but it's suitably insane. There was, there was, Hairism. Hairism. There was one more I'm tempted to put in, which was the far right activists use fitness club to recruit members. And this was Active Club Scotland. Maybe it's not a, a peak worker. They're actually doing it. But it's hope, not hate again. And they'd found that there was a, they were using these the cover of martial arts to actually be all racist and that. So there was a network of fascist martial arts club. Just thought it was a funny thing, a fascist martial art. Don't I mean? Like you're learning karate, but secretly he's putting in little, you know, like, yeah, here's how you want to do a kick. Yeah, you want to get, yeah, yeah. By the way, what do you think of Hitler? Because, you know, it's like, how does it work? He's like, I suppose Fight Club did tend towards a kind of men getting together fighting can sort of, can sort of quickly spiral into fascism, can't it? It's a bit like going out for a walk in the country. Yeah, dangerous stuff. All right, well, that was Peak Woke. Uh, thanks to everyone for listening and watching us in our new studio. Uh, we once again should plug the live show April 8th at the Hippodrome in Leicester Square, London. Uh, we should also plug basedmedia.org where you'll be able to get all the paid content because we're ending the free bit now. So if you want to hear more of this kind of gobbins, go to basedmedia.org and sign up there. If you want to support me, it's buymeacoffee.com slash Nick Dixon. You can leave me a message there and a little donation. I'll reply to you. Or nickdixon.net, where I've now got my own custom domain on Substack. That is my Substack now, nickdixon.net, for my brilliant articles. Toby, anything you'd like to plug? Well, we should just say that um, if people do become a gold member, a gold subscriber, um, uh, not only do they access all our premium content, like the next part of this show, which is just for premium subscribers, they also get to come to our live shows for free, as well as join our Zoom calls once a month. So if if you become a gold member... Um, not only do you get the premium content, you can see the rest of the show. You also get to come to our live show at the Hippodrome in London's Leicester Square on April the 8th for free. Yeah. And all the haters have said no one has signed up for the gold tier. We already have gold members. We've got gold members. It's incredible. Now. The grift is working. So <laughs> we're now in the studio. So you get all our extra content in the studio. You get um, for five pounds, you get all your extra content. Ten pounds, you get the Zoom call. For a bit more, you get the everything thing that you just said. The live show is free. The Zoom call. You can come to Toby's house. You can live in his shed. It's a very extensive offer. I think that's pretty much... Oh, anything else you want to promote quickly, Toby? Uh, I think that's more or less it. Just, you know, if you enjoy the content on The Daily Skeptic, dailyskeptic.org, click on donate. And of course, if you're not yet a member of the Free Speech Union, what are you doing? <laughs> you know, the world is... Western liberal democracy is just sending into totalitarianism. You're going to be targeted any second. You need to join the Free Speech Union. We'll do our best to defend you. It's less than £60 pounds a year for full membership, £30 pounds for... Uh, discount membership so what are you what are you hanging about go to freespeechunion.org forward slash join forward slash all right brilliant so we'll see some of you on basemedia.org but until next week stay skeptical stay skeptical <laughs> <laughs>